Well, while our offering is being taken, I have a question I'd like to ask you. Have you ever had um, the awesome privilege or that awesome opportunity, thanks Josh, of having someone tell you that you are an answer to their prayers? Has that ever happened before? Has anyone ever looked at you and said, you are an answer to my prayers? What a beautiful thing, right? What an awesome thing to be a part of, that someone at some point was looking to God and saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to provide for this. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And here you come and you provide or you support or you encourage or whatever it is that you do. And they look at you and say, you are an answer to my prayers. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to witness. Uh, when I was in student ministry and I was leading a student ministry, uh, we decided to uh, really focus in on making um, some low-income apartments a better place to live. And so we would go volunteer, we'd go serve, and we had gotten to know uh, the manager um, at these low-income apartments, and we had asked him, is there anything we can do? Is there anyone that you know who is in need? How can we serve? And he said, you know, as a matter of fact, there is. There's a gal here who is here um, who, uh, who has cancer, and, uh, but at the same time, she's taking care of her teenager granddaughter and teenager third grader, right? So this gal is already a, well advanced in her age, and she's also struggling with cancer and the chemo that makes her weak and makes her feel sick. But at the same time, she's somehow providing for and caring for her teenage granddaughter and uh, third grader daughter. And, and uh, what was happening is that the apartments had received some grant money to fix it up a little bit. And so what they needed was they needed everyone to move from one building to another. Well, he said, I don't know how she's going to do that. He said, so do you think you could help for them? And uh, so we said, absolutely. And so we met with this gal, and yes, she was this frail old gal who, you know, was wearing <laughs> scarves on her head because she had lost her hair from the chemo and radiation. And, and uh, we set up a date to come, and it actually took two days to get it done. But we brought trucks, and we brought a ton of students, and we paid for pizza and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Just to, and, and, and so for two days, we moved, right? And it was on the last day, um, I was coming back with one of the last loads, and I come across this scene, right? You got to understand, though, it took two days because this gal had been living there for a long time. She was a bit of a hoarder, and, and it was just, you know, like, they had cats that didn't know how to use the right, you know, area to go to the bathroom and stuff. I mean, it was kind of bad. Um, anyways, and we had just spent uh, so much. You know what happens when you move into a place and stay there for a long time? It's incredible how much stuff can get stuffed into corners, you know what I mean? It was insane how much stuff she had. It was incredible how much stuff that we moved. But anyways, I was coming back uh, from one of the last loads, and I came upon this scene. She was talking to one of our older students who had a pickup. He was there for both days, and she had his hands um, in her, you know, in her wrinkly, in her wrinkly shaking hands, and she had tears running down her face, and she was kissing his hand and saying, you guys are an answer to prayer. You're an answer to my, thank you. Thank you for being an answer to my prayers, right? Oh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to know that you get to be, like, connected to God in such a way that someone literally went before God saying, I'm in need, and God's response was, here, you can have them. And it was at that time I remember thinking, what if we hadn't done this? What if we hadn't got involved with this the apartment complex? What if we hadn't gone to, to get to know this manager and asked him a really good question, how can we help? What would she have done? Right? There's a void. There's something missing. Right? When we are disconnected from God and, and not connected with what he wants us to do. Right? Guys, you can be an answer to prayer. Do you know that? Do you know you can be an answer to prayer? And we're going to talk about what that is today, but real quick before we even get started, I'm going to embarrass a couple people. Listen, uh, we've been without a worship pastor for a while, okay? And uh, we have uh, been looking. Now, I just need you to know, because we've been, we've been having people have been asking us questions, and you just got to know that, um, you know, we're searching. <laughs> it's not for a lack of searching. It's just that it's a part-time uh, worship pastor position. And when it's a full-time thing, you know, we can ask people to move for us, right? But no one's moving for part-time jobs these days. And so we're having a hard time filling in. But until then, we have two answers to prayer. Uh, right over here, Dan and Cindy, um, who have been doing this for us, completely volunteering, right? 
And uh, they truly are an answer to prayer. Now, what's really cool is that um, they have their own little answers to prayers, don't they? Uh, because they have Sundays that they need uh, to get singers and, you know, musicians. And it's a very kind of specialized field of volunteering. And so we have wonderful guys like Mike over here who's been playing guitar and bass like all the time, right? Um, Dan and Cindy who have left, um, they, they you know, the one playing guitar here and, and she was singing here. They both have pneumonia right now. So they're going to go home and rest. Right, but they're both on like anti, uh, uh, on uh, antibiotics. I almost said antidepressants, and that's not what they're on. <laughs> they're fine. They're not. They're not on that. Yeah, <laughs> and then I wanted to say antioxidants. It might be a long sermon, folks. <laughs> Buckle up. No, anyways, but uh, you know they showed up anyway. You know they show, So guys, we can be an answer to prayer, and we want to learn what it takes to be that. Right? What What does it look like? How does it take to be? an answer to God's prayer. Jesus has a prayer. We, we read it at communion, but that prayer that Jesus prays, you could be an answer to that. Let's, let's dig into that after we pray. Again, I want to challenge you right now, like we're going to open up God's holy word. This is your chance to interact with the living God, okay, through his word that is active. It's like a double-edged sword. It's like a light upon our, uh, to our path. It's like food. Jesus talks about it being like food, right? So, so this is your chance to participate. And when we pray, this is your chance to ask God to speak to you. So why don't you do that with me right now? Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word, we just, we, I have a declaration from all of us, God. We just want to know you better. We want to know you more. Would you reveal yourself more to us now? As you reveal yourself to us, Father, I pray that we would know ourselves more. That we would have a clear vision for those around us. That you would help us to see our purpose. That you would help us to know why we are here and what it is that you want us to do, Father. As we know you, I know many of these questions are answered, Father. So we come before you willingly, asking for your spirit to come and speak to us, God. That our hearts would be softened and ready to receive from you. That your, the word uh, would come into us like a seed and it would grow. And it would create life, Father. I, pr I pray that you would keep the enemy quiet, that his lying, deceitful, and uh, condemning lips would be quieted right now that we might hear simply from you and your word. We accept you now, right, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray, amen. So once again, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in, in John 17, starting on the first verse, okay? John 17, starting verse 1. Remember, Jesus is about to go to the cross, Hey, this is where he's at. In his story, he's getting ready to be arrested, to be falsely accused, uh, to be sent before a, a Gentile court where they're going to find there's nothing wrong with him. And the only way that he's sent to the cross is because there's a threat of rioting. And then he's going to face a torturous death on the cross. Now, thankfully, we know the rest of the story. He comes back to life. Now, we are in a series called He Changed Everything. Right? We've been in it for, what, three years, three and a half, almost four years? And we've been going story by story through the life of Jesus Christ. Now, what I'm really hoping, just so you guys know, what I'm hoping is that when we get to the resurrection of Christ, it's going to be on Easter. Okay, So we're actually going to have a sermon series in, uh, in the, um, uh, during Christmas season. Okay, it's, I'm, I'm kind of testing it on you guys. I've never heard anyone do a Christmas series like this before, so you're kind of my guinea pigs. But I've talked to the staff for a few weeks uh, just to kind of work out stuff. And we're, we're really excited about it. So we got a series coming up during Christmas. And then we got the elders also have a few things that we want to uh, bring before you guys in the form of some sermon series. So, so just so you know, we're going to continue with the life of Jesus. We're just going to have a couple more breaks like the Befriend series. Um, but so we're, I'm also just, I'm just being honest. I'm also buying some time so the resurrection can be on Easter. Is that cool? Okay, we're just buying some time. It's going to be awesome. So um, God's got a lot of good things to say to us. I've been already writing the Christmas messages, and I'm pumped for them. They're going to be really challenging. So, all right, so John 17, Jesus is about to go to the cross. Listen to the prayer he has, okay? John 17, 1 through 5. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven, and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that your Son may glorify you. For you have granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that you know God, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. 
I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Okay, so Jesus is saying this prayer. God, I want you to be glorified as you glorify me. Again, the cross seems like a backwards way to glorify someone. But the message of the truth the go- is what we call the gospel. The message of Jesus in his love and grace on behalf of God is what we call the gospel. And the gospel message, when the gospel is truly preached, Jesus is glorified. You can't help but look at Jesus and be like, woo Actually, I, I always look to the cross when I talk about Jesus. But once again, the cross is empty. That's why we have an empty cross, because Jesus is alive, right? So when we look at Jesus, we recognize like we were stuck in sin, enemies of God, and that Jesus came in and turned that around so that we could be sons and daughters adopted by God. That causes us to glorify God, right? And so what's really amazing is that when Jesus says this prayer, now, Father, glorify yourself as you glorify me. You are the answer to his prayer. He's asking God to do something. And it is us that carries it out. Because what good is a message if it's not told? What good is the gospel if it's not lived? So you see, you, when you respond to Jesus' love, when you respond to his grace, when you accept him, when you say, you know what, God, your way is better than my way. I think I want to live and do the stuff you did. Because I've done it my way and I've seen where that's left me. I want more of you in my life, Jesus, less of me. When you do that... You become the answer to Jesus' prayer. Now, we're going to unpack this a little bit. We're going to look at this and understand a little bit of the deeper meaning going on behind this by looking at verse 3. So if we can put it back up on the screen as well, we're going to be at verse 3. Now, listen to what he said. Now, this is eternal life. Now, okay, whenever the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the giver of eternal life, says this is eternal life, and it's not followed up with some like long parable or confusing story, Let's perk up our ears and really listen well, okay? Because Jesus is about to just give a straight-up awesome truth. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life, folks. That's eternal life. Eternal life is to know God and to know his Son. That God is who he says he is, that God did love you enough to send his son Jesus. To know him is to have eternal life. That brings us to an interesting question. An interesting question, which is, hey, if, when does eternal life start? When does eternal life start? If you had asked me this question before um, I wrote this sermon, I probably would have just responded the way that a lot of people responded. When I think eternal life, I think of heaven. I can't wait to get to heaven. It's going to be great. I'm going to shed this old self, this temporary life, and its temporary desires will disappear. I've had a lot of temporary desires that have caused me a lot of pain, folks. Okay? Right now, I don't get to eat anything. I'm on this, like, special diet because my old self couldn't handle temporary hunger. Okay? All right? So, So, like, these temporary decisions, okay, They have a way of causing me a lot of pain, so I cannot wait. The biggest one for me is that when I was growing up, I was introduced to pornography at a really young age, and it's been like this demon on my back since. That I can go a long, long time without ever looking at pornography, never looking at a woman the wrong way, but I know I am two steps away from just embracing that sin again in my life. You know when I get to heaven... Man, that's going to be, when I pass, whatever, whatever that veil looks like, when I pass through and that desire is gone, I will know true freedom, a freedom that I have desired for a long time. Right? So I look forward to heaven. I can't wait for eternal life. But that's not what Jesus is saying here, is it? I mean, we think eternal life, we think heaven. But guys, we got to refocus here. we got to refocus on the truth. What did Jesus say is eternal life? It is knowing God and knowing Christ, which means 
that if you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have repented of your sin, if you've been baptized and been clothed in Christ as you've received the gift of the Holy Spirit, when you have pursued Jesus in this way, eternal life has already started for you. That's the truth. You don't have to wait for eternal life to start when you die and shed this temporary body. That just like Jesus was fully God and fully human, a bit of heaven came to earth in Jesus. Now, when you accept Jesus into your life, a bit of heaven comes into you. You are clothed in Christ. You are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And eternal life starts now. That you can have a taste of pure love, real joy, real peace that, that transcends all understanding. A real kindness and goodness towards other people. That can start being formed in you now. Because eternal life is given to you now. When what, and what that means. When Jesus said these words, okay? Now, this is where Jesus is not popular in our culture today. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's a message I don't like to preach. Because it is not popular. It is not something that people accept very easily. But when Jesus said these words, that eternal life happens... When you know Christ and know his son, Jesus, who he sent, that a line is drawn in the sand and you are either living eternal life now or you are the walking dead. Okay, I'm not making that distinction and I'm not judging you. <laughs> okay, do you hear me? But Jesus draws a line in the sand that, that eternal life, true life, starts in Christ. And until you have accepted that, embraced that, you repent, you've been baptized, you've received him in that way, you're simply the walking dead. Now, I've been there before. Yeah, and if you're thinking about the zombie movie, that's okay. Because honestly, zombies is probably the best way to describe it. It's just the living dead. Yep, they're wa yes, we're walking around right now, but eventually the ultimate demise will come and that's it. I mean, we're just kind of waiting to die. I've been there. I know what it's like, the hopelessness. I mean, there's good stuff in it, too. <laughs> I remember just getting to embrace selfishness all the time and not feeling bad about it at all. There's a lot of good that comes from being the living dead. Right? But Jesus draws a line in the sand and he says, Listen, if you know me, it is through me that eternal life starts. Now, that eternal life... I've already kind of alluded to this before, a little bit already, that eternal life is given to us in a very specific form, okay? It's, and uh, we're going to look at Luke 7, Luke chapter 7, uh, verse 37 through 39. Listen to what it says. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Now, we've heard Jesus say this kind of a thing before. Okay, uh, he said it to the Samaritan woman by the well, where he said, he said, I am the living water. And when you think living water, when you think of the water that Jesus gives, you got to think of like flowing water. When I lived in Colorado, um, one of my favorite places I'd go hiking at was called Seven Bridges. And there was these seven bridges that went over this river as it went up into this, uh, went up back into the mountain, right? And the water was crystal clear, beautiful. You could drink straight from it. It was awesome, you know, especially in the springtime when like the snow was melting and it was super cold, right? Um, it was amazing. It was one of my favorite times to go hiking, okay? So when I think of the living water, the way that Jesus describes it, it's a constant, fresh, new source, Right? And we know it as love and as grace and as guidance, you know, all these beautiful things that we get with Jesus. But Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me. Right? But then he goes on in verse 38 and says, whoever believes in me, as Scripture said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So not only is it about coming to Jesus to receive the drink ourselves and to be refreshed ourselves and to find love and to find grace and to find that stuff that our hearts truly desire in God. It's no longer about that. It's about the fact that God puts it inside of you. Verse 39, he, he meant by the Spirit. When he talked about the living water flowing out of us, he meant by the Spirit from uh, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. The Spirit hadn't come yet because Jesus hadn't been glorified yet, right? And so when we believe, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what happens is that living water that was in Christ comes and resides inside of us and starts flowing out of us. What a beautiful promise. What a beautiful promise. That when life leaves you thirsty, disappointed, filled with anxiety, broken, hurting, 
whatever you might be facing. Jesus says, come to me. Be filled. And when we put our eyes on Jesus, when we glorify God by knowing him, we receive this eternal stream, this eternal life, not only flowing next to us, but in and through us. You know, what's really cool is there's this guy, his name is Oswald Chambers. Now, Oswald Chambers, uh, I, I, I forgot. I used to know, like, when he lived. I'm not going to, it's, I've forgotten it by now. Okay, but anyways, <laughs> Oswald Chambers, uh, when I was a young pastor, I found his book sitting in a prayer room once, and I was, and it has, like, um, the dates, every, every day of the year is accounted for, and every day has, uh, has a uh, devotion on it. And it was actually a devotion from one of his sermons. His wife took notes during his sermons, and after he passed away, with the help of her children, they made a devotional out of his sermons, right? I, I, I told my wife she doesn't have to worry about doing that, okay? But, uh, but here's what's cool is that when you hear he, these words, they're filled with such wisdom and such grace and such understanding, it'd be tempting to imagine some wizened, you know, white-haired man bent over for many, many years of service, but Oswald Chambers died not much, not much older than I am right now. He was a young man <laughs> filled with wisdom. I think that's why young men love Oswald Chambers because there's something about him that's relatable, right? But again, he's filled with so much wisdom. But listen to what he says on this issue, okay? Listen to what he says. He says, a river is victoriously persistent. I'm going to say that again. A river is victoriously persistent, overcoming all barriers, for a while, it goes steadily on its course, but then it comes to an obstacle. Or a river will drop out of sight for miles, only later to emerge again even broader or greater than ever. When it runs into an obstacle, it makes a pathway around that obstacle. Do you ever see God using the lies of others, but an obstacle has come into your life and you don't seem any use to God? then keep paying attention to the source. Did you hear that? He says, keep paying attention to the source, capital S. And God will either take you around the obstacle or he will remove it. The river of the Spirit of God overcomes all obstacles. Never focus your eyes on the obstacles or the difficulty. The obstacle will be a matter of total indifference to the river that will flow steadily through you if you will simply remember to stay focused on its source. Never allow anything to come between you and Jesus Christ. Not emotion, nor experience. Nothing must keep you from the one great sovereign source. What's really fascinating is that Oswald Chambers takes this idea of the spirit that we receive when we believe. When we, ex when we receive eternal life, the spirit that we get becomes this river. And a river that is victoriously persistent, that no matter what, it will either... Remove the obstacle, which you've seen that, right? Have you seen the power of a river, how it will cut through rock, right? Or it'll move around the obstacle. Or it will disappear for a while and emerge greater later. That the Spirit of God flowing through us, when we keep our eyes on the source, is unstoppable. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior... He wants to, in you and through you, turn your life into a constant flowing stream of living water that nothing can stop. There is no trial, there is no difficulty, there is no person, there is no situation that will keep you from glorifying our Father in heaven. There is nothing that can get in your way, nothing that the enemy can put inside of you, nothing that he can lie to you about, nothing that anyone else can say to you that can keep you from stopping to say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Nothing can stop you. But it comes from remembering the source. It comes from remembering the source. We got to keep our eyes focused on the source, folks. You know what happens when we keep our eyes focused on the source? If we're a river of, and you know, 
I mean, if you were in camp like I was, I got a river of life flowing out of me. Right? Makes lame to walk and the blind to see. I don't remember the rest of the band. I got a river of life flowing out. Okay. Spring up, well, well. Goosh, goosh, goosh. Okay. <laughs> that if that's you, right? <laughs> when you think about the source, it does something to you. It keeps you humble. You know why? Because what is a river without its source? It kind of stops being a a river, right? You take away the source from a river, it's not a river anymore. You see, when you and I keep our eyes focused on Christ, when you and I keep our eyes focused on the God who saved us, who loved us, a very true reality will come to you very quickly. And it'll be hard to accept that you're nothing without it. I mean, again, what is, a, what is a river without its source? Well, it's a dry valley. It's an old pathway that eventually becomes overgrown and forgotten. Now, that's scary, isn't it? I don't care who you are. The idea of being forgotten is scary. We want our lives to mean something, don't we? We want to be known for doing something while we're on this earth. We want to live beyond ourselves on this on this earth, right? Well, Jesus wants the exact same thing, folks. Jesus wants the exact same thing. He wants a river of life coming out of you. A river that provides life for so many others. That's what a river does. It changes an ecosystem. Plants, animals, the the plants and animals inside the river, the plants and animals that depend upon the water. Rivers bring life. But the only way it happens is if we keep our eyes on the source. Because this is eternal life, is to know God, the one true God, and Jesus whom he sent. And when our eyes are focused on that, when our eyes are focused on being a fulfillment of a prayer of God, to, being, to, 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 to be an answer to prayer of God, when our eyes are focused solely on glorifying God, not only are we going to overcome every single obstacle in our lives, but other people are going to find life in us. This last week, we've lost two dearly beloved ones of our church family. Longtime members, Ken Larson and Bruce Miller, passed away this week. Yesterday was Ken Larson's funeral, and immediately after the serving service, we're going to remember and celebrate the life of Bruce Miller. Now, I didn't know Bruce very well. Um, Ken, though, I'd been around for a long time, and when I was doing, uh, when we were preparing for Ken's funeral, you know, it's at the end of your life, uh, someone's life, you really start looking back and just kind of thinking about everything they've been through, right? And it's just incredible, guys. The lives that these two men lived and the impact they made for the gospel, it's amazing. Uh, Ken, uh, Ken was a pastor for many years, and and then he became a professor at the Bible college. Um, even while he was doing those things, he was actually a camp manager at two uh, Christian camps, one of them in Wisconsin and Pine Haven Christian, which we, we send our kids to here, right? My kids love Pine Haven. Man, they love Pine Haven. All right? And so for many years, Ken was a pastor, and he was serving the church, and then, and then he served the next generation of churches. You know, when, when Ken was a little boy, or when Ken was a, was a teenager, a pastor came to him and said, hey, I think you should try Bible college because I think you could have a real uh, gift in preaching, right? And so he, he went to Bible college and gave his life to the ministry. I wonder how many times he had that conversation with a kid at his camp, right? But then even while he was in Bible college, I mean, he was training the next generation of church leaders, Right? And, and while he was doing that, he was still preaching. There's probably a, a Christian. There's probably not a Christian church in Minnesota that uh, Ken hasn't preached in at some point. And then when his body wouldn't allow him to teach or preach or lead, he continued to serve here as often as possible until the last couple months of his life, where he physically couldn't walk any longer. He was here stuffing bulletins every single Friday. He was here every single Wednesday, and, and I'm telling you what, guys, every time the church doors were open, Ken Larson was here with his wonderful wife, Betty, who he lost beforehand. Seventy years they were married, but he, they were here. He was here in his little suit, looking super proper, and supporting everything that we did around here. 
right? And as I was preparing for Ken's funeral, as we were talking about Ken, I couldn't help but wonder, how many lives did this man touch? How many people found eternal life, true life? They came to the spring that was flowing from his life through the Spirit, and they found Christ. Bruce Miller. Bruce Miller was also a pastor. For over 25 years, he pastored. Listen, it's something special when a guy sticks around a church for over 20 years. It's special. After that, he went on to be the president of the Bible College, the president of the Bible College, folks. And he led an organization that, again, was preparing the next generation of church leaders. Do you know how many men and women are working in the church, keeping the church alive today in Minnesota and around the nation? Do you know how many people are missionaries all over the world showing the love of Jesus to people because of a college like Minnesota Bible College? And Bruce was the president, a big big part of leading it to where it needed to be. Even after that, when he probably could have retired, he continued to go into ministry. And on the top of that, check this out. I had to write these down because there's so many of them. On top of that, he was on many different boards, including the North American Christian Convention, the National Missionary Convention, the Alexander Christian Foundation, Emanuel School of Religious Associates, and the Publishing Committee of, of the Standard Publishing. You guys understand? Like, and some of you might not get it, but in the Christian world, in the Christian church world, those are huge names. I mean, we're talking nationwide influence here that this man had on proclaiming the gospel in many different ways. Oh, yeah, by the way, he was also on the Rochester Chamber of Commerce Committee of Education while he was here. I don't think the guy slept. <laughs> I think that's what the, the generations before us did before Netflix and YouTube. I really expected the older people to laugh a lot harder at that one. <laughs> I just set it up to just, come on, you guys could have, no, go. As, as, as I think about the life of Bruce Miller, guys, it is not an over-exaggeration to say that thousands, thousands, through his influence, through his life, have had a chance to know eternal life. Do you know what heaven is going to be like for Ken and, and for Bruce, right? There's going to just be a flood of people who are going to lovingly go to Jesus first and probably visit from family members, but then <laughs> Jesus is going to be like, hey, you see that guy over there? You owe him a lot. <laughs> and here's the thing you got to understand, folks. <laughs> Bruce and Ken would be the first ones to stand up and say, we're not super Christians. They'd be the first ones to stand up and say, you don't have to be a pastor to do this. In fact, Ken, I, again, I knew Ken pretty well. He would be the first one to say, Jeff, I'm still growing in my relationship with Jesus. That's what he would say. It's not like these guys were, you know, like got to this, uh, this level and then suddenly this started working. Folks, they kept their eyes on the source. They kept their eyes on the God who first saved them, who loved them enough to give his son away, and that's what continued them going. They were servants of the Most High God. They gave their lives to the Most High King because their eyes were focused on the source. And now thousands of lives have been changed, have been influenced, have been touched because of two guys. Do you see the power, the potential of the living water in your life? Don't you see that this God who created all things perfect, all things right, all things good, created you for the same kind of rightness? Now, because of our sin, we are separated from that, but the, the key is found, okay? The cure is found in Jesus Christ, and now you carry that message. You now carry the living water. You now carry a perfect love, an unconditional love that is given to you that can outflow out of you now into the lives of others. You now carry with you the potential of pure peace and pure joy and goodness and kindness to all people. It is inside of you now in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Church, I got to ask you, is your life a consistent and unafraid, a constantly flowing source of life? How did Chambers say it? Is your life a river that is victoriously persistent? Is that you? 
Or do you find yourself feeling more like a dried up riverbed that might end up being overgrown and forgotten? Listen, I'm not trying to like, make you afraid or shame you or guilt you. In fact, come on, the whole point of the cross was to take away our guilt and our shame. No more guilt and shame, okay? No more guilt and shame. Love and grace, love and grace, love and grace. Grace and peace, grace and peace, grace and peace. That's what Paul said all the time, right? Grace and peace, grace and just accept it. But guys, we got to be honest with ourselves. That a life lived in Christ focused on the source can be this constantly flowing source where people get to meet heaven through you. God is glorified. Jesus is glorified through you. Is your life a river that is victoriously present, or are we closer to a dried up bed, right? How do we fix it? How do we fix it, folks? It's simple. Keep your eyes on the source. It's not easy, but it's simple. Keep your eyes focused on God. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Keep him in focus at all times. You realize he has you in focus at all times. Put your focus on Christ. Now, the way we do this, okay, one of the ways we do this is we encourage you guys to get into your word. One of the best places to find a connection with God is to just get into his word. Now, his word, is, it's a big book. It can be kind of confusing sometimes. And so we offer you guys these reading plans, okay? Pull out your blue card in your bulletin. Okay, we have next steps in there for you. Okay, there's this reading plan called No Regrets. Okay, No Regrets. It's in, you can find it in your, um, on, your, on the Bible app on your phone, the Uversion Bible app. Um, in fact, you can... Um, you can go down and, and look for events. There it is. Download the Uversion app. If you choose more and then go to events, you'll see Hope Summit. You'll see a live event from us. Okay, and you can click on that and it'll take you to this no regrets. Get into your word, folks. Get into the Bible. Spend some time with God's word and you will get to know him better. You're going to get to know yourself better. You're going to get a better perspective on life. Guys, like this is good, right? If you don't want to use your phone for this, we have paper copies at the Connection Center. Okay? I want to see all those gone. We print them off. Let's see them all gone. So go grab one of those if you don't and spend some time in your word this week. Get into the presence of God this week in that way. Okay? So we we I mean, and <laughs> if if you're a member of Hope Summit, this is what we do every week, right? Do you ever wonder, like, man, when are they going to give us a different challenge? Well, pfft, on that. <laughs> what better challenge can I give you than to go spend some time with God? Yeah. I mean, do you need me to be like, go treat your neighbors nice? I mean, I can, we can have, like, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood kind of <laughs> sermons if you want. Get into your word, folks. Exactly. Get to know Jesus. Janice is really excited. Janice also has a really worn out Bible, by the way, so she sees, she sees the beauty of it. All right, next thing. Again, you're going to be tired of hearing this. I don't care. We need to get you guys into a community group. My goal is that we would have 75% of all of you in a community group. I just saw a thumbs up go up from someone because they're like, yeah, we're doing it. <laughs> Jeff has been talking about this for like three years, and we're doing it. Yes. I want to see 75% of you in a small group. You know why? Because we believe that life change happens in community. Church on Sunday is great. It's great. But life change happens in small church. When you meet with like 10 people or less, and you look at God's word with one another and be like, okay, I'm not doing this. Okay, do it, right? I mean, that's what my community group's doing to me. As a pastor, I know I should be memorizing God's word. Right? But I mean... What was, what was our, okay, my, my, I got one of my small group guys in here too, and that was our challenge, memorize a verse. And I did it. I didn't do it because I knew I should. I did it because I had a small group challenging me to do it. Guys, get into a small group. Get into a community group. If you're not in one yet, man, I know it takes time. I know it's busy. I know and there's a lot of things going on but in your life. But listen, like this is a group that's going to connect you to the source Right? Eternal life is going to spring from you in such a way that like, you know that like, other people are going to be so blessed because of it. Right? If you won't do it for yourself, do it for them. Get into a community group and allow others to help mold you and help you become more like Jesus. The third one, again, we say it every single Sunday. 
Let's find a place for help you to help you serve. I promise you this. You will have Jesus in sight more often if you're giving yourself sacrificially. Because at some point, you'll give yourself sacrificially, and you'll be like, why am I doing this? Why am I giving so much of my time to this, right? And when that time comes, man, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit's right at your side, and he's like, you're doing it for me. <laughs> you're not doing it for them. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for me. There are some ways to get to know Jesus that can only be found in service. So let's get you moving, folks. There's lots of places to serve around here, and we're in need. And this church runs because of volunteers. It's not because we have staff, right? You guys all think all I do is just write sermons. <laughs> we need volunteers, right? So let's find a place to serve. Again, it's not because we're in need of volunteers. It's because we want to help you connect to Jesus. Listen, as we pursue Christ, as we, as we go and do these things so that we can get Jesus in our focus, right? You're going to find you're going to find yourself being an answer to Jesus' prayer. How cool is that? That you get to be an answer to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Son of God's prayer. You get to be the answer. You know what's incredible, though, is as you are an answer to his prayer, you'll probably find yourself being an answer to other people's prayers. And that question that I asked, has anyone ever come to you and said, you are an answer to my prayers? You're going to start hearing that a lot more often. And it's not from doing good things or being a good Christian. That's not what it's about. It's about keeping Jesus in focus. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you always have us in your sights. Thank you. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you. Lord God, as we go from this place, the enemy is going to give us so many distractions to pull our eyes away. Father, I pray that our eyes would be solely focused upon you, your goodness, your love, and your grace, and that it would start to transform us from the inside out. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, and I pray we would know him more. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Real quick before you go, I, I forgot one thing. Listen, if you have yet to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, okay, if you have yet to be baptized, we have another baptism coming next week I'm excited about, okay, but but if you have yet to be baptized and to say, you know what, Jesus, I need you in my life. I want your way, not my way. That's repentance, by the way. If you're ready to say, you know what, I do believe and I want more of you. Come talk to me, okay? How many of you had that conversation with me before? Go ahead and raise up your hands. How many of you had it? There's some. Is it scary? <laughs> Michelle just said it was scary. Well, you lived through it, didn't you? Okay, so you're fine. No complaining, Michelle. Good grief. <laughs> no, it's not bad. We sit down and we open up God's word together. Let's talk. If you have yet to accept him, come find me. And let's talk about getting baptized. Let's talk about what it means to have faith in Jesus. Is that cool?